um, a video. So let's go ahead and watch that. Then we'll get into work. I'm actually kind of quiet off stage. A lot of people don't realize that. I was at a dinner party recently. A bunch of people that I don't know. One guy talking plenty for everybody. And then me, myself, right? And then I, and then myself, right? Me, me. I couldn't tell this one about I because I was talking about myself. And then me, 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 me. Beware the me monster. So I tried to jump in with a little story. I don't want to just sit there the whole night. Right when I'm done with my story, this guy goes, that ain't nothing. Oh, well, didn't mean to waste everybody's time. Telling my nothing story. Here, let Marco Polo speak. He's back with tales of adventure. My story ain't nothing. Maybe it wasn't, because I made the mistake of trying to tell a story about having only two wisdom teeth pulled, and I learned a lesson. Don't ever try to tell a two wisdom tooth story, because you ain't going nowhere. The four wisdom teeth people are going to parachute in and cut you off at the pass. Halt! Halt with your two wisdom tooth tail! You will never complete one, trust me. I'm trying to tell my story. You know, I had some wisdom teeth pulled. I had, um, I had two, but I had four pulled. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, five, no, nine. I had nine wisdom teeth pulled. All of mine were impacted. They were all coming upside down. The roots are wrapped around my tongue, coming out my nose. They were tusks. I was a warthog. No anesthesia. They pulled them out with pliers. I was eating corn in the cob that afternoon. Pin the blue ribbon upon his chest. That knocks the socks off of my wisdom tooth tail. Why do people need to top other people? I've never understood it and I see it all the time. Obviously people get something out of it. At best people wait for your lips to stop. Yeah, as soon as... Okay, yeah, you, me! You, me! You see the difference? You see, you see that? Now I do. Hey, man. Beware the me monster. <laughs> you have a scripture and turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 18. Or you can see it on the screen as we begin to talk about fasting arrogance. And take a look at humility. So Luke chapter 18 is found um, in the church Bible or page 853. We'll start reading at verse 9. We'll read through 14. It reads as follows. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. Let's right. Amen. Amen. word of prayer. God, we thank you that we've reached a moment where we can anxiously anticipate hearing a word from you. And so, God, we pray that you decrease us so that you may increase in and among us, that you may speak and we may hear, and may we not hear your word and not be changed by doing your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a story about a man who lived in a town, and he was well known in his town as a man of great wisdom and humility. And because so many of the town people felt blessed by um, his acts of service and 
his gifts of wisdom. But they decided that they were going to gather together and give him a medal. And so they had this big gathering for him, and they gave him a medal that had engraved on it, our town's most humble citizen. So a couple of days passed, and they gathered again and decided that they had to re, um, go back to him and take the medal back because the day before, he had been seen wearing it. You cannot be the most humble person anywhere if you wear a medal saying that you're humble. <laughs> And so humility is actually at the core of our passage today. If we look at the book of Luke in and of itself, it, um, it is often designed to show how Jesus affirms the worth of the people on the margins, those who are very humble in their lifestyle. It also is um, written in such a way that it wants to show and affirm that Jesus' love has no limits, has no boundaries. And Jesus, throughout the book of Luke, uses um, this gift of story, which is what we call parable. So parables are allegorical stories designed to teach us uh, religious or moral truth. And so here is where we are. Jesus um, is talking with his disciples and probably a few others who are gathered. But Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, knows that there are those gathered there who who see themselves as being righteous because of the wonderful things that they do. And in doing so, or seeing themselves in that way, they also hold others around them in contempt, as if they are not as good as they are because of their actions or their lifestyle. And so Jesus tells them this parable. The parable starts with a stark contrast between two characters. One character is a Pharisee who represents um, religious authority and this strict discipline of the Jewish lifestyle. And the other is this tax collector who is also Jewish, but is known throughout culture or assumed throughout culture to automatically be someone who is a chief, who is ruthless, who is um, a sellout to the powers that be. He is an Uncle Tom, if you will, only with more power. And so we have these two contrasting characters and Jesus says, well, both of them come to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee stands alone and he begins to pray aloud, as I have witnessed some of our brothers and sisters do. And he says, God, thank you that I am not like these people. I thank you that I don't steal and I don't rob. Thank you that I'm not like that girl that talk junk in my office. And I thank you, God, that I'm not so pitiful that I have to put other people down. <laughs> God, I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. Because you know what? God, I fast twice a week. Now, he praying this out loud. Can you imagine? <laughs> and I give a tenth of all that I have. This tax collector is far, far back. He never really made it very deep into the temple. He can't even look up as he just constantly beats his chest. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says that this tax collector is justified when he leaves the temple, unlike the Pharisee. Why? Because those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I think it is worth our time to recognize that not all Pharisees were arrogant, and nor were all tax collectors repentant. But Jesus is painting this stark contrast between these two figures. Jesus is showing how different they are in an effort to show us how alike they are. Jesus wants us to see their similarity, which is what they both need the same thing. They both need Jesus. They both need the grace and the mercy of God. Because neither one of them are righteous. The difference is one knows he's not and the other doesn't. <laughs> neither one of them are able to save themselves. Just one is acknowledging it and one isn't. Both of them, I would argue, really do want to be close to God. It's just that one thinks that his actions will get him there and the other knows that he has to depend on the grace of God. 
So there is a similarity that is here that Jesus uses their differences to paint. But we shouldn't be too hard on this Pharisee because I believe it is the Pharisee that Jesus intends for us to compare and contrast our life with. Amen. Amen. He's actually the one that he's saying, I want y'all to look at him and compare yourself to him. Right? It's not the tax collector. It's the Pharisee. And if we really spend some time looking beneath the surface at this Pharisee, we might actually find some things that surprise us. Like the fact that arrogance is often a mask for insecurity. How those who are grossly self-centered or narcissistic, as we would call them, are often at their core very lonely and feel very unworthy. They feel unlovable. And so in their attempt to be worthy, they have to feel com competent. They do things to be more competent, to be right, to do the things they need to do in order to feel okay. But even those of us who are not constantly self-centered, and I pray that I am among that group, because I really, you know, it's hard to tell if you're self-centered without somebody else calling it out, right? <laughs> but even those of us who aren't and are on, our, on a regular basis very self-centered, we all have this moment of our pride and our fear creeping up in such a way that we feel the need to, to tell other people about what makes us so great. Because we're afraid that if we don't, we won't be respected, we won't be liked, we won't be loved. And so there's this constant push for us to be a mindful of our arrogance and to cling to humility. Fasting at its core is designed to make us humble. And the truth of the matter is we should really pity this Pharisee because he fasted twice a week, which means he gave up food quite often. And he didn't reap any of the benefits. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to give up food, because I like food, <laughs> I want to reap the benefits Amen. of it. And so we're going to spend just the next few minutes talking about two perspectives of humility. The first that we're going to look at is that humility is a response to God's grace. Humility is a response to God's grace. So God's grace is unmerited or undeserved favor. It is God giving to us something that we don't deserve. Now, honestly though, this is a very hard concept for most of us to grasp. Why? Because we feel much more comfortable being in a position of giving than we do receiving. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but I have a friend who is about to publish a book called It Is More Blessed to Receive. And the premise of the book is that when we feel like people are giving us something that we have not earned or don't deserve, we feel like that is a position of weakness. We don't want to owe people anything, right? We want to feel obligated to pay a favor back, right? And so it's harder to receive sometimes than it is to give because if I am giving, I'm, I got stuff to give, right? I'm in a place of power. I'm in a place of position. And so this concept of grace becomes very difficult for us to grasp because we don't want to owe anything to anybody. Now, I would say that some of that feeling is probably justified because we all know people who hoard their good deeds over us, right? I was watching an episode of a show, I don't know, several months ago, and there were two sisters in this episode. One sister needed a kidney transplant and the other was giving her kidney. And the sister who was sacrificing her kidney said to the other t um, sister all the time just how thankful she needed to be that she was giving her kidney. That nobody else in the family would do this and she felt like she had a right to give her sister advice about her life and because she was giving her kidney, her sister had to take her advice. She told her sister, you know, you're just so unworthy but I'm gonna give my kidney anyway. She had elevated herself to the level of Satan to the extent that the sick sister said to her, you know what, keep your kidney. <laughs> I don't want your kidney. <laughs> She's like, but if you don't take my kidney, you will die. She's like, I don't care. <laughs> She's like, I will take my chances and put my name on a waiting list rather than spend the rest of my life having to listen to you tell me how you saved my life with your kidney. And this is something that I can never repay. This is 
is what I call the lump of still skin syndrome. This idea that we reward ourselves for the good deeds that we do by demanding of others an unfair level of gratitude. Yes. Now some of us, you know, if we were honest with ourselves, might be able to admit that we've helped out, you know, some people over and over again, and there have been times in our minds where we feel like, oh God, you know what, they should really be more grateful. Right? And it doesn't mean that gratitude is not necessary because God has created this world in such a way that there is giving and receiving. Right? It is very unnatural to receive an act of kindness and not at least give some sentiment of gratitude. A thank you. My mama say you write thank you notes. To this day, when people give me birthday gifts, it's instilled in me. You write thank you notes. Right? So there is this sense of giving and receiving, but we cannot really fully grasp God's grace because God's grace is free. And we receive God's grace every day simply by waking up. Whether we acknowledge it or not. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. We got it. But there's something about that that is unsettling to us. Because God does not give to us in order to receive. God gives to us because God loves us. But Tom, Father Thomas Ryan, who wrote the book, The Sacred Art of Fasting, he says in this book, he says, you know, our tendency is that we, um, we believe that if we change, God will love us. When the truth of the matter is, God loves us so that we can change. So this Pharisee did not understand this concept of grace, and we know that he didn't receive the, understand this concept of grace because his fasting was doing nothing. It meant nothing. He did not understand this concept simply because he did not realize that in order to do good things, someone first had to be good to him. Back to this giving and receiving. People who are truly humble in their spirit, truly humble at their core, they are able to graciously receive what others offer with gratitude. But also they are able to humbly <coughs> give to others without an expected payment. Right? So there's this balance between giving and receiving. Uh, African bishop came to my home church one time and he, he said, you know, if you pay attention to the Jordan River, it flows down into the Sea of Galilee. It receives the Jordan. The Sea of Galilee receives the Jordan and it gives the Jordan. But the Jordan River ends at the Dead Sea. He says, now the Sea of Galilee is full of life. It's full of fish and life. He says, why? Because it both receives the Jordan and it gives the Jordan. He says, but the Dead Sea is just that it's dead. Why? Because it receives but it never gives. That's what God's grace is about. It's about learning about this ebb and flow between giving and receiving. God, I receive your grace and I am humble because I know that there is no way I can ever give unless first you have given to me. I am not more better than my brother or my sister because anything that I have isn't mine anyway. And she came up to me and she put a check in my hand. And I was so humbled by that because it was such a large amount. And I said, thank you, thank you. She says, you don't have to thank me. She says, this money was yours before I got it. She says, all I was doing was waiting for God to tell me to write a check. She says, but the moment I got that word, the moment God said to me, write this check to God, and I knew that that money was never mine. I was just a conduit. It is designed to, re to reveal to us all the ways that we have gotten it wrong so that we can repent and get it right. So that we can actually hear the voice of God and become humble in such a way that God is able to what flow through us. Humility is a response to God's grace. Why? Because when we receive the love and the free grace of God, we understand that we are to be gracious towards others. I forgive because I have first. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. And that is where 
this Pharisee was missing it. He did not understand this concept of grace. He did not understand the ebb and flow. His fasting did nothing. Why? Because he lacked humility. Humility is a response to God's grace. Second, humility is an act of loving God. It is an act of loving God. Now, God's grace is his ultimate expression of love towards us, right? I mean, what greater love can a person have, right, than to lay down his life for a friend? And to do so knowing that that friend is undeserving, right? So God's gift of grace, giving us what we do not deserve, is his greatest love for us. But the question becomes, how are we loving God? In what way do we love God? So if we look at the word humility, humility means not arrogant, it means not off, it means, yes, yeah, not arrogant, not proud, it means meek. And one of the definitions for meek is patiently humble, or humbly patient, it means gentle and kind. And when I read those words, it reminded me of another passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reads as follows, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. The truth of the matter is, we often look at this passage of scripture and we think, yes, this is how I need to love my spouse. This is how I need to love my sister. This is how I need to love my mom or my dad. This is how I need to love my enemies. But what does it mean for us to look at this passage of scripture as a way of loving God? For the first commandment is not to love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment is not to love one another as God has loved us. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. And as I was preparing, please know that God really messed me up this week. Yesterday was especially hard. You can ask my husband, I was emotionally messed. Okay? <laughs> this is some real difficult stuff for me because God began to recall to me all the times in the last week or two I've just become irritated with God. God began to recall to me how many times I have insisted in my prayers that it be my way or no way. Even in the way that I pray. God, this is the way I really want you to do it. <laughs> how many times I've been boastful with God? I give God as long as the stuff that I've done so right and this is why he needs to just answer my prayers the way I want to. <laughs> but God, I've been doing this. God, I listen to your people. I listen patiently and I wait for what I pray for them, right? <laughs> God, I love when people are hard to love. God, I'm coming home and I'm fixing dinner and I'm cleaning the house and I'm doing X, Y, and Z, right? You're coming at me, monster. Rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> I am boasting before God as if God cannot see and God does not know. As if God will not be true to his word that says, what you do in secret, I will reward publicly. We just take it out of somebody else. Right? right? <laughs> Rather than being in conversation with God. But I think the most difficult part about this passage of scripture for us to really grasp is, is there a point in our life where we have been envious of God? I don't believe I've ever met a believer who's willing to consciously admit that they envy God. When I was, when my family was going through um, the days and weeks leading up to my father's death, he became sick very quickly, and it was declining very quickly, and um, we had some very bad experiences with doctors. We had um, reached a point, the culminating point of these experiences came when they were making one final recommendation, and our family had chosen not to take the recommendation. Now, never mind that every recommendation that they had made up until this point, we had taken every surgery that they suggested he had had, and none of them had worked, 
right? Never mind that they were very slow to admit the fact that they did not really fully understand his illness, right? But they kept making suggestions. Never mind that this new recommendation was not guaranteed to help. It would cost half a million dollars. It would require a round of the clock care. It would greatly decrease his already declining quality of life. And so we said, no, we do not believe that this is a step we should take. We made it as a family, my father included. One doctor says to my mother, she says, well, since you don't want to do what we're asking you to do, and you know more, we'll just discharge him and he can go home and die. A second doctor comes in and she says to my mother, he's like, you know, I don't understand why you don't want to make the choices that are best for your husband. Now, never mind that God was already preparing us and it already was, you know, getting us ready for my father's transition. We knew that this was his time. But in my reflection on this, what I realized about these doctors was that I know that doctors are, are trained to be um, very confident. But there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. And this was not all of our experience with doctors. We actually had some doctors who prayed with us. Right? And I do believe that we should rely on the medical um, expertise of, of doctors. That's not the point here. The point is that these particular doctors had limitations that they were not willing to accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know what they could not know. They wanted to have power over things that they could not have power over. Yes. Right? And in their desire to prove to others that they had place of being envious of God. Why? Because only God knows all things. Only God has power over all things. And when it's illuminated for me in my mind is that every time, Donna, every time you have wanted to know the future, every time you have wanted to control the actions of someone else, you were performing acts of arrogance that were in fact showing or reflecting your envy of God. Because if I want to know the future and if I want to control other people and God is the only one who has that power and I can't receive what I want then what I am envious of the one who has what I can't have. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant, love is patient and kind. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. Amen. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. This Pharisee could not make himself believe that this tax collector could be as loved by God as he was. Why? Because at his core, he wasn't really sure that God loved him. He was unable to love God because he could not first receive God's love. And there's the crux of this thing. The crux of this thing is that we cannot properly love God unless we are first willing to receive God's love. Unless we are willing to accept that there is a God good enough and great enough and compassionate enough and merciful enough to love us even though we can't offer anything back to him of substance. It goes against all of the rational thought of our human brains. But this is what the heart of humility is. Humility is about being able to accept God's love so that you can love God back. Another definition of meek is overly submissive. Fasting, this time of consecration, it is about submitting ourselves to God. And the submission of God is the definition of freedom. <clears throat> this quote by Thomas Ryan, pull the quote up. In the Sacred Art of Fasting, he says, self-discipline is a training in freedom. I am free to take something comfortable and pleasurable, or to eat and drink more, or to sleep longer. But I am also free to refrain from
from these things and not let myself be bound by them. The movement of self-discipline leads out of bondage to the self and into an experience of newness and freedom. Then back again to a liberated use and appreciation and enjoyment of material goods in moderation without becoming entangled again by a thousand little threads. Fasting is about freedom. Humility is about freedom. Why? Because in my humility, in me grasping the grace of God, in me being able to love God back, I am free to what be me? I am free to no longer try to prove my worth because God took that burden from me. I am free to say no to stuff when it's time to say no. And so what do we do? We fast. We say, no, I will deny myself this so that I can be free when I am not denying myself of it to still say no. Amen. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there's some stuff we can't say no to right now. There's some stuff in our life that, like Paul says, no matter how hard I try, I keep doing the things I don't want to do. The things I want to do, I can't. And we don't want to be like the Pharisee of this parable who is denying himself all these things and never really is able to be free. Never really able to be able to walk a path of humility. To walk a path of this ebb and flow of receiving so that he can give and giving so that he can receive. So over this week, during your time of prayers, we continue in our fast. No matter where you are, I know you may not be doing the full out fast just yet, but whatever steps you are taking, consider these reflections during your prayer. Do I have a more difficult time giving or receiving? Do I become uncomfortable when I feel like, you know, someone is asking me to give something that's gonna be a sacrifice? Have I had a hard time committing to this fast because I have to give up eating certain foods? Or do I have a hard time asking for what I need and then receiving from others because I think it makes me feel weak? How do I feel about God's grace? Really think about it. How do I feel about receiving something that I can never repay and that, that I freely give even if I don't acknowledge? What have you shared with God around? your feelings about grace. If you haven't shared anything, share it. If you have shared, continue to share with God. God wants to be in conversation with you around that. <coughs> Based upon Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, where do I want God's help in loving God better? Have I been irritable or envious? Or have I insisted on my own way? Have I stopped believing or hoping? And where in our lives have we been asked to endure in love but have been unwilling? Where has God says, I want you to love through this? And we're saying, no, I'm tired of loving in this situation. I'm tired of performing loving actions. I'm tired of doing loving things. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not saying that you, you know, have this as a part of your life, but just in case you're a little blind to it, just ask God about it. And the third, I mean the fourth is, is pretty much the most difficult. Ask God to teach you humility. And the reason this is very, very difficult is because when we pray prayers like this, they're what I consider dangerous prayers. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> they know. When we ask God to teach us humility, God often teaches these kinds of things by giving us experiences that teach us. So if you're gonna pray this prayer, if you're gonna have courage, pray this prayer. With me, I'm, I'm going to pray to you in Jesus' name, because Lord knows. Yeah. I need my humility. I thought I was humble until I started, you know, praying and writing a sermon. And Jesus was like, Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I was more like the Pharisee than I thought, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but if you're going to pray this prayer, you have to be willing to be ready for God to put you in humble circumstances. <laughs> God is going to be humbling you during the rest of this time of the fast. God is going to be showing you things, revealing things to you, making you aware of things that maybe you had 